Welcome back. This is part two of subtopic 4.4 materials and polymers. We are starting with this science understanding. The production of synthetic polymers allows the manufacture of materials with a diverse range of properties. We need to be able to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of synthetic polymers. On this slide, I've basically just summarized the advantages and disadvantages. We'll start with the advantages. The first one is that they have a diverse application, so that means that the properties can be tailored to its specific use. They generally have a low manufacturing cost, and they generally have comparable properties to natural materials like wood, glass, and metals. And one final one is that we can use additives or fillers. Um, these can be essentially added to further improve their properties, uh, both chemical and physical. On the flip side, the disadvantages is that many are produced from non-renewable resources. The environmental impact of waste is a massive concern. Uh, we know that only some are recyclable uh, and or biodegradable, and these additives or fillers can often leach into the environment and they may be harmful. This is the next understanding. Organic polymers can have different properties, such as rigidity, depending on the monomers and the degree of cross-linking between chains. We'll need to be able to compare the physical properties of polymers with different degrees of cross-linking and secondary interactions between polymer chains. This point's just been shifted from an earlier point, but compare the effects of heating on thermoplastic and thermoset polymers. The structure of a polymer can be manipulated to provide various properties, and this can include things like rigidity. Uh, this is the inability for a material to be bent or forced out of shape. A contrasting property is flexibility, so it's essentially the opposite of rigidity. We have strength, the capacity for a material to withstand force. Uh, elasticity, the ability for a material to resume its normal shape after being stretched or compressed. And a few other ones of note are thermal conductivity, flame resistance, opacity, or the relative clearness of the object itself. These physical properties are affected by... Firstly, the nature of the monomers, that could be their size and or polarity, could be the size of the polymer, or the degree of branching or cross-linking. If we start with the nature of the monomers, we could say that non-polar monomers will produce non-polar polymers. Non-polar polymers exhibit weak dispersion forces between the molecules, so this typically means that they have low rigidity and strength. Whereas monomers that typically produce polyesters and polyamides uh, and or contain polar functional groups will exhibit stronger dipole-dipole interactions in hydrogen bonding and therefore are generally stronger and more rigid. The second consideration is the size of the polymer. So if we look at an increased size of the polymer or mass, this is going to result in stronger dispersion forces. This then results in increased rigidity, strength, as well as melting point. Thirdly, we can consider the degree of branching or cross-linking. So branching, which we can see in yellow here, can affect the molar mass, as well as the ability for the polymers to pack closely to one another. An example of this would be uh, low-density versus high-density polyethylene. Cross-links, on the other hand, are covalent bonds that exist between polymer chains. We can see in this diagram in red are these so-called cross-links. Crosslinks essentially increase the rigidity of the polymer because we have extremely strong interactions essentially binding these polymer chains together. And so we would expect for these types of polymers to be able to withstand changes in their shape through the addition of force. If we introduce a bit of light crosslinking, then generally this can make polymers a bit more elastic as well as flexible. In this diagram, we can see the effect of the degree of branching or crosslinking has on the characteristics of our polymer as well as the molecular weight. So if we compare the uh, characteristics or properties of linear branch versus cross-link, we can see that they do differ in their properties. And in general, the greater the extent of cross-linking, the greater the hardness, the rigidity, um, as well as the brittleness and durability of your polymer. To look at this idea a bit further, we're going to consider rubber. A natural rubber is essentially um, produced from a substance known as latex, which is a milky substance that can be produced by the sap of some plants or trees. Natural rubber is primarily composed of a polymer of isoprene called polyisoprene. There will be also some impurities as well as water. What we can do is carry out a process known as vulcanization. So this changes the properties of rubber into something that is uh, harder and more rigid. 
and examples of vulcanized rubber can be found in car tires, in gloves, and in shoes as well. The vulcanization of natural rubber essentially involves the addition of sulfur, which is this eight sulfur uh, ring here, with the addition of steam and pressure. What this does is it introduces these uh, sulfur bridges, so these covalent bonds that will actually hold these polyisoprene um, polymers together. These uh, sulfur crosslinks uh, are what essentially increase the rigidity and hardness of rubber. So turning it from something that is typically quite soft and elastic into something that is much harder and more durable. From this point, we're just going to be defining polymers and classifying them as one of two types. The first one is a thermoplastic, which is also known as a thermosoftening polymer. Thermoplastics can be linear or branched. They generally consist of little to no cross-linking. Um, that means that they are held by relatively weak intermolecular forces. They are recyclable, and that's because when we apply heat, they can soften and the polymer chains can essentially be separated from one another. And what this means is that you can then remold and then repurpose this um, polymer. Thermosetting polymers or thermosets, on the other hand, consist of a significant amount of cross-linking. This can be formed through additional condensation reactions between polymer chains and uh, covalent sulfur-to-sulfur -sulfur bonds, like we saw with the vulcanized rubber. They are virtually unrecyclable, and that's because when we apply heat, they typically tend to decompose or char. And that's through the, I guess, breaking of covalent bonds, not necessarily of those uh, cross-links, but it can include the covalent bonds within each of the polymer chains. An example of a thermoselling polymer is known as melamine, which we can see here, and it's typically used to produce this sort of unbreakable dinnerware. Some of you might have that at home. In this image here, we can see the effect of heat on both thermoplastics and thermosetting polymers. So with thermoplastics, you apply heat and you can separate the polymer chains from one another. So effectively melting it and then cooling it allows it to be remolded and reshaped. Thermosetting polymers, on the other hand, because of these cross-links, uh, we would have to apply a significant amount of heat, but when we do, it can cause the breaking of various covalent bonds, so that can include the cross-links, but like I mentioned, it also includes the covalent bonds that hold the polymer chains together, so that causes degradation of your polymer structure, um, which we can associate as also decomposition or charring of the polymer. For the next science understanding, Polymers can be made from fossil resources or from renewable materials. You'll need to be able to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of making polymers from fossil resources or from re renewable materials. Most polymers are produced uh, using non-renewable petrochemical feedstock. This includes things like petroleum and natural gas in their production. So polymers made from renewable materials are generally plant-based. They can be derived from carbohydrates, proteins and triglycerides. We can see some examples of feedstock here being used to make them. In this image here, we can see the different types of materials that can be used to produce these renewable polymers, um, which we typically refer to as biopolymers. So they could be agro-based feedstocks, uh, lignocellulosic feedstocks, as well as organic waste feedstocks. And we can essentially refine them and produce a range of products. This here further supports the idea that biopolymers or bioplastics, as we can call them, can be used to make a wide range of different materials that are in our everyday life. Here I've just summarized the advantages and disadvantages of using non-renewable petrochemicals versus renewable materials. So if we start off with the petrochemicals, the advantages is that they're relatively abundant. The raw materials are generally easily obtainable. Um, there is established infrastructure in uh, mining and processing these materials and there are many diverse applications of them. Disadvantages, however, is that these being non-renewable resources means that they are going to be depleted over time. On the other hand, with our renewable materials, the advantages include that the fact that the biomass feedstock can be quite abundant. The raw materials are also easily attainable. Byproducts and waste products may be used. Um, and also that they're renewable disadvantages, however, is that there is a limited range of these materials at the moment, and they may compete directly with land use for food production or energy production. To finish up, this is our last science understanding. Some polymers are biodegradable, that is being able to be broken down by microorganisms and other living things. 
uh, we'll need to be able to explain why some polymers are biodegradable but others are not and explain the advantages of polymers being biodegradable. Firstly, the word degradable means the ability to break down chemically and polymers may degrade due to interactions with chemicals, so chemical degradation, uh, heat, light, as well as organisms. Biodegradable polymers are typically broken down by microorganisms, which include things like bacteria, fungi, and algae. These microorganisms produce enzymes that can help catalyze the decomposition of our biopolymers. These reactions typically involve the hydrolysis of ester and amide functional groups, especially if they're obtained from natural polymers such as carbohydrates, triglycerides, and proteins. This is a clear advantage of biodegradable polymers because microorganisms are typically unable to break down polymers which are made from petrochemicals. In particular, they consist of addition polymers, and as such, they remain in the environment for extended periods of time so they don't break down readily over a short period of time. Here we can see a diagram showing you a model for biodegradation of a biopolymer. Um, so this is an example known as PLA or polylactic acid. This is the polymer structure here. So we can see that the um, enzymes in these microorganisms can attack these ester functional groups um, and allow for hydrolysis reactions. So they break the polymer structure at these sites here and as a result end up producing lactic acid. This lactic acid could then be broken down and metabolized by the microorganisms, uh, essentially breaking them down and uh, extracting the energy from it in an aerobic process to then produce carbon dioxide and water. Here we can see the biodegradation of PLA. Um, so given the right conditions and over time, we can see that it will essentially break down and those nutrients will return back into the soil. It's important to consider the use of biodegradable polymers because we know that plastics in general can contribute to a lot of pollution, both on land and in the oceans, and this photo helps show you that. Another major concern is that plastics that end up in our oceans typically are mistaken by marine life as food, so they can consume these plastics, and this can prove to be quite harmful for them. That concludes our work on subtopic 4.4 materials and polymers. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.